So some people joined a little bit later. So, um, uh, um, Ethan, do you want to recap from the start? Sorry, before. Uh, before. <laughs> uh, so my claim is just that, like, um, Stefan is arguing that, um, like, in his talk, that decentralization is more genetic, and so we don't really need to worry about it because if our architecture is genetically um, predisposed towards decentralization, then naturally everything will end up decentralized. And I disagree with that by um, posing the example of the internet as something that I believe is like the most genetically decentralized um, architecture or something. And then there's like this example, I think from 2014, of um, a hub that just misconfigured their BGP router and could no longer forward um, packets to Europe. And uh, there was like a very large swath of America that the only way that they could connect to Europe was through that one router. And so they I would like showing that as an example of a situation where um, probably because uh, there wasn't a whole lot of concern over um, forming like a robust decentralized topology in the early days of uh, the internet that caused a very non-robust situation where a single hub could um, prevent connections. Okay, I will briefly respond, recap what I said in response and then maybe let's kind of zoom out a little bit maybe go around and, and see what people are looking to get out of the session. Um, and then maybe we can circle back to this uh, discussion at the end. Um, so my response to that was that um, I, I agree that the internet has a lot of decentralization in its genetics, um, but it, it, it's sort of its inherent architecture. Um, but I also think that because of when it was created, there were a lot of techniques that weren't known back then for increasing decentralization. And so I think there is a certain amount of centralization built into it, not because anyone wanted that, but because that was what was available. I think the, the most interesting lesson we can take from that isn't that um, uh, the decentralization is not genetic, which may or may not be true, but um, that just copying the internet is maybe not decentralized enough. Um, but yeah. All right. Can we go around and then just what everyone is trying to get out of the session? Oh, um, <laughs> I recently implemented the route protocol for the first time and finally I like, understood it a little, little bit more. Um, but know that there are some criticisms of like not having it be. So I'm, I'm thinking about two things. One is like the security of it, and I think there are ways to mess with the current interledger network that we have not fully thought about or tested or like and that, that kind of worries me just as as this network grows like there will be more reasons to attack it and so I think that's an area of, of concern um, and then I'm also thinking about um, whether we've gone I think in different points we've gone back and forth on whether we assume that every node is like very actively managed and the decisions that each node makes are like re the result of some like highly you know, business optimized processes versus like more more automatic. And I'm thinking about, um, like I do think it is important to have a bigger network, but it is, it's a like, obviously controversial thing about whether we assume every node is run by someone who's got like a full-time person that's just working on like, thinking about routing, for example, um, or whether it's more amenable to nodes that come and go and can, can adapt to that. Um, and the thing that I worry about with saying with, we assume it is a very actively managed thing is that um, it seems easier to, if you make it easier for an individual developer, it seems easier to go from that person like being like, oh, maybe I'll do this full time and like get some more people to work on it and sort of form a company as opposed to if you assume, if there's just a very high burden to getting started, kind of getting it working to start with, I worry that we'll just have a hard, hard time like building the ecosystem around it, which then turns into companies. These are the things I'm, I'm thinking about. Yeah. Uh, I think what would be nice is a formalization, like understanding how we formalize CCP, because I don't think it's formalized at the moment. Uh, discerning between what's implementation details currently with JS, because yeah. all four of us used a reference implementation that were, like as you said, you came up with for a need to do it, and like maybe say, they keep taking a step back and saying, well, this is a bad idea, while we've got people who have implemented different implementations here, I say, okay, well, let's try to standardize and formalize that. Um, and then also understanding uh, specifically with auth, there's no like clear understanding of what auth means. Um, you mean that the auth 
<laughs> this, <laughs> this is unused. Auth is a, is a great cautionary tale for why you should not try to be too clever. So. <laughs> uh, echo all those. Um, I feel like from a, th from a theoretical perspective, there seems to be debate maybe between you guys over the years about do we need auth? And then there's like this tangential, like we've consulted experts in BGP. And like it was like, they were like, yeah, we, we should have started off with secure BGP, but then you spoke with another expert. Like it'd be great to hear like kind of current thinking maybe from you two or whoever else has thoughts about it's the auth question, but like in my mind, I kind of ignore auth and don't feel bad about it because it seemed like your current thinking was like, we don't need it. But it'd be great to know if we need it. If we need it, we should probably introduce it and do it sooner rather than later. What are you trying to get out of the session? Uh, just, just I'm interested. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was cold, so I came yeah. here. And, uh, I, I'm curious about uh, once I, I've heard from Adrian, mm. uh, someone was uh, trying to do some research for routing. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the research? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. So I want to know the re result of the uh, research. And uh, one thing I'm uh, curious about is uh, about liquidity. So what is more difficult than uh, Internet packet routing. Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, what what is more difficult than the routing of internet is uh, about liquidity. We we have liquidity on the uh, collectors, so we have to dynamically choose the route that has uh, liquidity. Mm -hmm. So that is more difficult, I think. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. so sorry, my poor explanation. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, so it's not clear to me what's going on in the routing space mm -hmm. here because um, I'm not sure if I understand completely the specifications or are people uh, following that specification, uh, like different implementations, how they are dealing with routing. So that's one thing. And if whatever I understood from the specification is like it's kind of similar to what BGP is to some extent, but not exactly what it is. Uh, and I don't like how BGP works. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, it's established fact that every single day we see a new incident with BGP. Um, it's insecure. Um, it's, I don't know what auth you are talking about, but mm -hmm. if it's authentication. Mm. We can talk about it in more detail. But yeah. yeah um, uh, so basically, like, there's two things that I'm concerned about. Um, is what is the base protocol and second security, mm -hmm. um, which I think both are still not present. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I don't really know what the current state of art is. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, I'm basically just here to listen because I don't know a whole lot about how IP routing works and I'm interested in learning more about it. Okay. Um, well, any suggestions what we should? Or what yeah, what do you want to get out of it? Oh, what do I want to get out of it? Well, so I am the author of the much maligned um, <laughs> IoT Connect implementation of routing. And um, Basically, the situation I find myself in is that I have spent a decent amount of time thinking about the routing protocol and maybe what it should look like. Um, I, I started out mostly focusing on simplicity. That's why the initial version was not secure, because you know if you want to make it secure, you have to make a lot more decisions about um, what signature algorithm you want to use and, and how that should be done efficiently and, um, you know, you could copy those choices from BGP SEC, that's certainly a possibility. Um, when I was doing my research, I found at that time perhaps too many voices critical of BGP SEC to be comfortable with the decision to just copy those choices. Um, I think more recently, um, I've 
we kind of begun to appreciate the importance of security and routing a lot more. I think if we want to do things more like the open network, it's almost a requirement, um, you know, because you don't have that sort of out of band governance um, in, in effect. And so, um, right now, my goal, I guess, not necessarily for, the, for this session, but more generally, is to see who wants to perhaps take up the mantle a little bit in terms of driving the routing protocol forward. Um, because I'm now running a company and, and uh, finding that I have a lot less time to dedicate towards um, working on that problem. Uh, We're just going around and saying every, what everybody's interested in getting out of this session and sort of what's the interest in routing. You are done. <laughs> yeah. we, we've completed the circle. Okay. Pretty much it's been off. Oh, no, um, <laughs> what is my goal for the, for the session or like just generally or <laughs> generally, in your generally life, your life related to routing yeah okay. you mean routing <laughs> no routing <laughs> his goal is to convince everyone yeah to <laughs> call me routing um, I guess part of it is uh, I don't know Part, part of it was just <laughs> part of it was just observing um, and and making sure I understand how it works. So I'm kind of just staying in touch with what people are thinking. Um, but another thing I think we need is um, a much clearer definition than just reference code for people to use to be able to come into the project and understand it. Because I think it's a pretty important piece of internet is how you exchange routing information. So. Uh, and then, uh, I guess kind of slightly tangentially is uh, we need to define something similar for the Modulu project because we're using interledger style routing, we need an interledger style root exchange protocol if it's not this exact protocol. Um, for me it was just I wanted to listen and observe and see what the direction of the way things were going. Uh, Stefan, could you elaborate some on like, what guarantees secure BGP gives? Yes, so, I mean, maybe you'll be even better than me. I can but. talk about RPKI, but not secure BGP. Okay. BGP set is... I, I'll give my attempt, and maybe you, if you hear anything that I say that that, that is wrong, you can correct. Um, so, BGP sec is essentially an addition to BGP, which defines one of the optional fields that you can attach to any BGP um, route advertisement. Um, and this additional field contains a uh, list of signatures from each of the um, routers that has forwarded the route, going from, starting with the origin all the way to you. And uh, what that allows you to do is to verify that the path that is claimed for the route is actually the true path. So um, the way you know that it is actually coming from the origin of that path is because each origin is assigned a public key by their regional authority, so Aaron in the US. Um, and um, so I know what key it should be, and then um, I can verify if, if, if they've signed with that key. And then everyone who forwards the route is the same thing. They, they sign, hey, I got it from here, I send it to here, and so I know that the path is true. And the problem that that solves is right now, anyone can claim to be arbitrarily close to any origin. And so one very famous example is there was a, um, a provider, I think it was Pakistan Telecom, if I'm not mistaken, um, who advertised YouTube prefixes. Um, now that was actually, I think a problem that, uh, yeah, so that, that, that was actually the problem was that they um, advertised more specific prefixes than YouTube, so basically everyone adopted them because the first rule of internet routing is the most specific prefix always wins. Um, and so basically everyone started routing all YouTube traffic to Pakistan. <laughs> um, they were actually trying to just censor it within Pakistan, mm -hmm. but that's not how PGP works. It uh -huh. just spread out uh -huh. everywhere. Um, so it, all the traffic was rerouted to Pakistan Telecom <laughs> and they couldn't handle it. So YouTube was just blocked. Can clarifying question on wow. what you just said. Um, the signatures, uh, how are those bound to an entity? Um, so the public keys um, are issued by the internet governance structure around um, 
um, IANA, which is the yeah, Internet yeah. Assigned Numbers Authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can go when you get a signature. You can go. Do you have like you have a, a certificate that you get from a database? That exactly. Says, so okay. you download the databases from all the regional okay. authorities, and they have like all the keys for all the um, origins and for all the AS numbers. Okay. So, so your what your identifier is your AS number. Uh, you've, there's two identifiers. There's the IP prefix. Okay. So like a, an address space. Yeah. And then there's an AS number. Okay. And so, I'm fuzzy on some of the details, but the basic idea is that you have these official databases that associate public keys with both IP prefixes and AS numbers. So you can for both cases, if you want to um, validate if a specific speaker, which mm -hmm. is the, the term from BGP node. Um, if a specific speaker, speaker is authorized to publish an advertisement sure. for a given origin, you, you know that, and then you know which speaker should have which public key. So the, okay, and so the only way you could speak for an origin that you don't have authority for is if you're effectively brought, if you're passing on something that you got from them. So you could only add yourself as like a second signature on top of. Um, so you couldn't, so you, if, if you got, let's say you got an advertisement that's like, you know, this is YouTube and it's five hops away. Yeah. You couldn't add yourself as a second signature only as a sixth because That's each what signature I mean, yeah. because yeah. each signature says, Here's who I advertised it to. Yeah. And so the only time you have a thing that you could attach your signature to and forward it is if YouTube literally signed your AS number and said we advertised directly. Yes, to you. okay. And the signature algorithms that are allowed? Um, it's only um, sec uh, R two fifty six. The so second piece two fifty six R one, um, also known as NIS two fifty six. Um, so just one to, one it's one to clarify, would That's what I was wondering. would BGP sec <laughs> have stopped the Pakistan <laughs> problem because YouTube wouldn't have actually signed or Aaron wouldn't have signed these new YouTube. Routes? Exactly. They wouldn't have had the YouTube's key, and so they couldn't have advertised on YouTube. Okay. What, wow. what would have happened then, like, I mean, it just would have been localized to Pakistan in this case, whoever it misconfigured. Localized. It would have been localized to anyone that doesn't use BGP SAC. Okay. And if, if everyone used BGP SAC hypothetically, they, it wouldn't have been possible to do. Like, even, if, even for the use case that they had, which is locally black hole yeah, traffic, they wouldn't have been able to do it through BGP. They would have been able to do it through like filtering on the IP layer, but they wouldn't yeah. be able to do it on the routing layer. Okay. And and what are the reasons people are not implementing BGP SIC? Uh, I can try to answer it. Yeah, um, yeah. So there are there are a couple of reasons. So one is um, it means that for every route mm -hmm. of which there are I don't know a million, one point four million or something like that. I don't know. Um, but it's like a large number, mm. um, and routers are pretty constrained devices, mm. right? Like you're kind of like already running it at its maximum capacity in a lot of cases, and so um, you get this all these advertisements for all these routes from your peers, and then for each peer that you have, you need to send them a route advertisement with a signature corresponding to that peer, which means you need to s make a number of signatures, which is the number of peers times the number of routes. Hmm. which okay. can be a very large number. And since signatures are pretty expensive to generate, that can be a lot of CPU usage. Hmm. Um, it l adds a lot of um, m memory requirement as well because you have to keep this chain of signatures for every route. Um, and so it's essentially just a resource issue. Yeah, um, yeah so it, it, it significantly adds to the cost of running a router yeah. if you do. I mean, it's only like a one time thing, right? Uh, no, every time the well, every time there's an update to the route, mm -hmm. you would re-sign it. I, I think there's some fields that, that you can update without re-signing, um, but I think the last version of BGP there was a lot of back and forth in terms of what to include under the signature. So like, you know, what would cause a re-signing, and I think they ended up with a fairly inclusive thing because people kept finding exploits against sure. the, you know, more limited versions. How often do internet routes change? I have no concept of like order of magnitude of time scale. So um, the problem is that people have different levels of quality in terms of how well they operate their networks and how well they operate their network or their, their routers. And so what tends to happen is that 
there is quite a lot of changes, not because it's necessarily necessary, not because the topology changes that much, but because there are a lot of people that have like some flapping route that keeps coming back online, like you mentioned, like some router that's just sort of like, you know, keeps rebooting every two minutes or something like that. And then that router will just advertise, I'm here, I'm not here, I'm here, I'm not here. And so that will just keep, keep propagating. And people try to do things like route flap dampening, which is like, if a route keeps coming back and going away, and uh, you know, well, maybe we'll stop that. Um, but actually, like when, when we were at the ITF, one of the meetings I was in was the routing meeting where they were talking about how route flap dampening turned out to be a really bad idea um, because it's actually some of the mechanisms that were implemented caused way worse problems than um, just the volume of route updates. So I guess like the short answer is it does change enough that this is a problem. Like band like not so much bandwidth, but like memory and CPU is a problem. And why couldn't you just sign peers instead of signing each route individually? Um, well, because you need to know, like, that person is going to re-advertise that route, and so you need to then well, like, if, to sign with that person. If you have that, like, each um, node has signed who they're accepting, like, income packets from, then couldn't you just use that information to build out which routes are... But if you have like one bad actor in that, it would propagate straight through. You only, you only re-broadcast portions of what you receive, so you have to sign <coughs> each sort of portion so that you, I'm, I, you know. My answer would be, I'm honestly not sure why that's not possible, <laughs> but I assume there's a good reason because otherwise it's hard to imagine they would have not done that. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose you could theoretically, tree. yeah, I, I suppose you could have like, if I sign each peer that I'm connected to, then I can just send to my peers enough information so that they can yeah. recreate the graph. Okay. What is it? No. That I, I Right? Maybe we just I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it it doesn't seem like sending a, like signing a like a root of a Merkle tree or something like that, and then sending specific like maybe that would just be too complicated. I don't think you even have to do this because like, literally like all you're interested in is does do you have a connection to YouTube or not? Okay. So you, if YouTube signs something that says Evan has a can I have a connection to Evan, then. And, and you you make that available to me. That's that's all that's needed, right? And you don't have to sign like. And it, let's say you get ten thousand routes, right? And now I want to be able to advertise those ten thousand routes. So I need to prove that all those routes I got from you. But do but don't you okay. filter them? Yeah, but you're only sending on two hundred of my routes. Right. So let's say I have a signature from you that basically just proves that you're connected to me. It doesn't say anything about the routes. It's just that you're connected to me. Oh, Couldn't I, I then say like, you know, here's all my routes and here's all the paths for all my routes, and then here's a signature package that has proofs for every link that appears anywhere in those paths, but it's only one signature for each link that appears, for each unique link that appears. So if there's a any path that says Evan Stefan, then in my signature package there's an Evan Stefan signature. If there's any route in my package that has a YouTube Evan um, hub then I have to include the YouTube Evan signature. But you could still mix and match path though. Yeah, and so like, but, but for, if there's a 10,000 routes that all have the YouTube Evan signature, or a YouTube Evan hop, then I would only include that signature once. But, but couldn't I still pass on bad data? Because I can say the path, there was a path of like Evan math myself, and then I change it. What yeah. I pass on, I change. Well, I, no, I still no. use, I still use valid like, hops, but I rearrange them and change them because all that I'm signing is that that hop exists. Maybe, but you know, I like I, I couldn't pretend that uh, that there's a route, you know, to you know Google.com through Evan unless Evan has given me a Google Evan signature, and so I don't think I could expand the graph beyond the proven links, and I think there should be security there. So just to make sure I understand, so this idea is more like. I, what I'm broadcasting is a view of a graph, and what I'm going to send is like a bunch of signatures on individual links, and all you have to do is like recreate the graph and sort of make sure that all the links are accounted for. Um, it's, yeah, or it's, the links that you care about are accounted for. Right. Keep in mind that the the graph is a just a list of paths. Yep. That's the format in which the graph is explained. And so you have a signature for every hop possible. Every hop that appears in the graph. In one of those paths, yeah. 
one or more of those parts. So this seems to reduce the number of signatures. Is that the prime problem with BGPSEC? Are there other problems with it that? It's definitely the most common I've seen quoted. Um, there's also a lot of concern around um, uh, algorithmic, uh, the, the just the complexity of the protocol, cost of implementing that protocol, um, the cost of if we need to switch to a different signature algorithm. Like for instance, like elliptic curve has a sort of a uh, you know expiration date associated with it with quantum computing, and so there were a lot of people complaining about that. There were people complaining about the the fact that the NIST curve that they chose in particular is uh, it, the uh, has some magic numbers in it, so people are concerned about that. Um, even though some people claim it's safe, or whatever. Uh, so those are some of the concerns I've seen. So is this curve like fixed? There is no agility in the other. Uh, no. So so uh, BGP sec. Yes, yeah, so BGP sec obviously create, has provisions for algorithm agility and. Um, one of the, th the way that they do that is they basically say like there's like um, a, a way to apply multiple signatures and um, each algorithmic suite has like an ID and so if we wanted to move from one to the other we would as, uh, attach start attaching both and then when there are enough people using the new one then we can deprecate the old. Um, but of course that adds even more computational complexity yeah, that get assigned yeah. twice. <laughs> So this one would have a signature for every possible permutation for each of the rounds because the order uh, nature of it matters as well? Um, like if you swap like Evan and Stefan in the middle of a bigger route. Why would we swap? Like if some, a bad actor like flip the order of Evan and Stefan in the bigger route. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, directional. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So each each signature says like the next top is X, and then that has to be the public key of X, and then right. it's the next top is Y. Okay. So, so the thing Wait, real, real quick, yeah, Tiger, yeah. did you have your hand up before that you had a comment or a question? Oh, uh, no, no, I just misunderstood. Just forget. It's okay. Sure. Wait, back to the base. Do we? Are we only in agreement we want off? Um, don't call it off. Call no. it like secure. Security. Right? Secure. Because off is like a shitty word. Yes. Though. Fair enough. <laughs> um, do we agree that we want it? Well, so if we don't have it, the cost is at a minimum that things like that uh, incident with YouTube happen. Um, and as you said before, there are almost daily examples where something happens somewhere where somebody fat fingers or maliciously injects a route or you know some Ukrainian provider accidentally um, adds a route that sends a bunch of American traffic through the Ukraine. You know what they do with that. We don't know exactly. You know, um, often these these mistakes happen with like government IP addresses and things like that, foreign governments. So probably is a lot of malicious usage of, of that feature or lack of feature of security. Um, and then going beyond the internet context, if we wanted to build a more open network, the big problem would be that um, you know if if I can connect to the network and I can publish routes. Well, I can blackball other people's traffic. So it's basically a non-starter for them. And and I would say the other the other thing sort of in between those is, is just like the fact that we're dealing with money also puts a stronger incentive to redirect traffic through you. Um, and so there's not just the sort of surveillance and censorship aspect. There's also just like yeah, if I can like get a piece of all of this traffic, it's a huge incentive for for like a sort of different category of. Of malicious or like rational actor to just be like, yeah, I'll publish routes and I'll will just forward it on. Like I'm not gonna black. Who get I don't want to black hole stuff because then I won't get money. Right. But if I forward it, uh, I will get money. Um, so I think that's another concern with that we've introduced. The one Dude. the one counter argument which doesn't change the overall argument I don't think is at least with interledger, you have to still be able to route it to the intended recipient. So you can go in and sort of try and change how routes, people root stuff, but if you can't get it to the end recipient, the route fails. It's not yeah, like IP yeah, where you bump up the fees. You know, yeah, you, you would take some of the action. Yeah. I, but I think that's still, a concern, and I think also um, just making the, like right now no one cares to attack the interledger network. That will change. Yeah. Um, and yeah, okay. if we make it really easy to attack, like. I don't know, a really specific, you know, like there's a specific example of a different community that might be fairly hostile to Interledger working out. And like, we're definitely going to poke them at some point. And 
Like, they, if, if there's Maybe a lead... by attacking them, for example. <laughs> <laughs> or just getting big enough that it matters. Um, and, like, yeah. it's a fairly no, hostile totally. group of individuals um, that, like, you know, we don't want to make it trivial to take down our network. Uh, hmm? Oh, I mean, it's more like planning to. Like, I don't, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there a question about authority? Yeah, that's so. So great that we would have this um, scheme, but who would be the authority? Like, what's the Aaron? Yeah, how are the IP addresses um, allocated? Yeah, what is that? great question. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I for all. first come, first serve is the. Answer. Well, you, well, you've always had a pa a, spa uh, a specific answer, which yeah, is I like, oh, you would depeer. I have more thoughts on that. Um, so, okay, well, first let's cover really quickly how the internet does it. I think we kind of touched on it, but um, there is sort of an international organization um, which is uh, well, like creating governance rules on a global basis, and in and, and most uh, developed countries, at least, uh, governments are members of that organization, and they've gone through a very interesting and drawn up process to um, become neutral such that different countries will accept their decisions and, and there were some interesting anecdotes I heard from somebody closely involved with that organization at that time where for instance China so sort of threatened to create their own domain name system and you know it took a lot of convincing to say like no no no, no we should have one global domain name space and you shouldn't try to reallocate .com for example in China it's like don't do that that's a bad idea <laughs> um, and, and it was interesting like uh, uh, you know in that anecdote um, apparently the Chinese delegation basically said like well, we would love for there to be a global single namespace. We just nobody told us what the process is to like participate in that governance <laughs> system, you know. And so, anyway, so there's an organization, and I actually give that organization a lot of credit and a lot of respect for doing this, you know, extremely well, given how hard of a problem it is. Now, of course, you can love you all kinds of criticisms where it doesn't perfectly work, you know, nothing is perfect. Um, now. In Interledger right now, there's no such organization, and so anyone can just start advertising any destination, and there isn't really a way to say, like, you're wrong and you're right, you shouldn't be advertising that person's prefix because nobody owns any prefixes. Um, I, I think that that works only to the extent that um, people don't care a lot about which prefix they're advertising. And of course, it doesn't allow any security whatsoever because if anyone has equal claim to any prefix, there's no such concept of you are signing it and that's more valid than someone else signing it. Um, I've, I've thought about the problem a lot and having worked a lot on blockchain, the solution that I would personally propose is um, a system where, which, which, which works in a very specific way. And you know, I can describe that if there's interest, but um, it would effectively allow um, people to advertise certain routes and without a central authority um, those to be claimed on a more or less first come first serve basis and I'm happy to go into the details of the algorithm if we want to spend the time that way. I'd like to hear it. But Let's, yeah. let, so should we split into, well not split into groups but like there's two topics effectively mm -hmm. that we want to cover is the secure routing and then the authority behind that. Mm -hmm. um, are we closing, are we kind of done with secure routing? Are we moving on to authority, or are we gonna come back to that? Mm -hmm. I, would def I would definitely make a note to investigate Ethan's idea of okay. potentially optimizing the... Uh, because, because where you finished with the secure routing was somebody needs to take ownership of the routing protocol and like yes. add this stuff, and I didn't see anybody putting up their hands. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, mean, I would actually don't totally understand that. The difference, to be honest. Well, the one is a dependency on the other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but, so but they are se they are very separate in in the internet world as well. Where BGP sec, it's a addition to BGP, and it's a format for how to attach these signatures to routes. Okay. So it's an addition to BGP. Um, the other effort that Adrian is referencing is called RPKIZ, RPK the routing public key infrastructure, and um, resource resource public. I'm sorry. Um, and um, what that what that refers to is a, an effort that actually preceded um, BGPSEC, as far as I'm aware, um, which is to even just like 
create these databases and say who should be announcing a certain prefix, for example, and like what should be the public key for a given autonomous system. So, so it's the, the difference between the, the, the key of the first node versus the giving the signatures on the path from the first node to you. It's keys versus signatures. It's all the keys mm, okay. from every node Got it. versus how do you sign it. Yeah, so you need the like you need the infrastructure to be able to go and say, given this key I've got, who does it belong to? Is the person that claims to be giving me a route the right person to have signed it? That stuff. Like you've got to go somewhere and look that up. Mm -hmm. You know, like in the same as we do with SSL, you've got a certificate. It has a chain back to a certificate authority. You trust that authority. In this case, there's one authority, not lots of certificate authorities. And, and uh, the the way that if we wanted to do it in a decentralized if we wanted to do it in a centralized way, which is say Adrian issues all the keys for everybody, we agree that we trust Adrian to do that. Um, probably the best. It's probably <laughs> that. No, but that would be like that would make it such that the uh, BGP sex side of things, like signing and what and how that protocol works, would probably be more complicated. But if we want to do the key issuance in a decentralized way, that might well make that the more complicated piece because yeah. that's actually non-trivial to, to design. And uh, so why is your, sorry, so it's, uh, why would it not be just like the hash of your public key is your identity or something like that? Um, you. Could do that. Probably want to eventually would, change your public you, key, though. You want to be able to change your public key without needing to like change your. Identity. But you, you, uh, well, you, I mean, but not necessarily. Like you could say that every time a public key changes, my IP address changes. That would cause more route updates, which wouldn't be as efficient. But it's not a complete deal breaker. Um, like when when we're talking about like how do we get the public keys assigned because we we're not constrained by like IP addresses being like relatively small numbers we have a pretty like IP addresses can be pretty big whether that's advantageous or not that's a different like that is a you know potential concern with that but that's like my first thought is just if you if your identity was just based on your key then it would be Pretty, and I thought we, I think we talked about this at some point, like then it would be pretty obvious like, okay, well, if the public key that hashes to that thing signed that route, like it came from the right person. But maybe I'm thinking like. Yeah, I feel like there was some reason we didn't go that way, but. I, well, you just end up with like really garbage looking ILP addresses, which is not like, because you just have like 32, you have like pretty long, I think segments. I think I remember uh, like Ben telling me that uh, he and Stefan decided against that because they want readable IOP addresses. Yeah, I, I, for some reason I think that's not the only reason, but yeah, maybe. But it, it, is. it doesn't allow. But it depends. Are you talking about like if my address, if I'm like a child of Matt, who's a child of you, would be like your key? Then his key, then my key. Well, so what I was I actually don't know. If, well, well hash what I was going to say is like it only makes the first segment unreadable. Yeah, I, I, because I, the I second segment could just be issued. A certificate issued by the first key. So, like for instance, if I if, if Evan is g dot some long hash, and I want to be g dot his hash dot Stefan, he could just sign a certificate that says mm -hmm. you know Evan issues Stefan's sub ILP address to me. Well, why would I trust? His signature versus because his signature of the his same key address. Hashes to that first segment, right? Oh, okay. His key hashes the first segment, so he's the the owner of that namespace below that hash. Gotcha. Because he has the key. And it's just not a pretty namespace, but it is a it is an obvious namespace. So it's almost like removing any semantic meaning from the first the segment. the first segment. Like whereas before it would have been like. G dot David, and I want to claim that I'm David because David's special. It's now just G dot gibberish, and, how and that, you get used to using it, I guess, I'm, right? I guess I'm trying to understand how that like flows down. I'm trying to think through how that flows down, like a sort of federated network of two or three tiers, top tiers, and then you know, one of them is advertising to the other of addresses in a sub namespace or somewhere. Um, is the you've got like a thousand twenty-three characters. Yeah. 
Mm. Pretty long. Yeah, it's pretty long. <laughs> characters meaning? Ask me ASCII. Characters. Yeah. Subset of ASCII. This is kind of a stupid criticism, <coughs> but one issue that Tor has is people will yeah. like do a partial uh, hash collision where they like collide the first four characters and the last four characters in order to trick people into thinking that the hash is the same thing, so that might be something that we run into as well if we have hashes for addresses. Yeah, you shouldn't really be able to see them. Yeah, I think most of the time LP addresses will be passed through a protocol like SPSP, yeah. where it's of human recognition is not a concern. That, that said, like, as soon as we decide to do this, there will absolutely be vanity addresses. Um, the question is just, is it a problem that, like, where will people use the, the fact that you can recognize parts of it? And is it more, because like, that's the first thing that I would go and do, is like, spend a bunch of money on like, getting a nice looking hash or something Which is like a that. really good point, by the way, because like, you can still make it human readable, even with the scheme, mm -hmm. right? It wouldn't yeah. be trusted human readable. Right, like, and so I, I, th I think it is a, it's a very valid thing to Clarifying too. question on what you're proposing though, like where you talk about uh, issuing whatever, Hash something dot Stefan to Stefan. So Stefan, the key that you use to sign roots that you pass on, that there's no hash of that included in those roots. Like it's still the hash dot Stefan dot Dino. It would be included in the route, but not in the. It's not in the, the address. address. That's what I mean. Yeah. So you you're still broadcasting. I have to broadcast roots my that are something dot Stefan, but you're signing them with the certificate that contains the evidence signature. Yeah, at some, okay. at some point, if you want to validate a path that I signed, that I originated or forwarded, um, it has to have a certificate, you have to have a certificate that that Evan signed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could also just say like every second is a hash, but I think that's maybe too constrained. No. That, that's what I was trying to work out, whether that Real actually works. Yeah. 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 The IOP addresses that get generated now already, like the, yeah. the GitHub one, I was like, it's what like, is, what is, is going... <laughs> I think that was, that was my suggestion actually, yeah. and I was like, damn, there's a lot of stuff yeah. being packed in there. Yeah, we put and the so payment pointer, hash payment pointer in the connection tag, and it makes it Is it hash or is it encrypted? It's base 60. It's encrypted and then base 64. Yes, yeah, so the it encrypted it part is what really makes, makes it really long. long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so put the payment pointer in the. In the con after, yeah, the, at the, after the uh, tilde of the LP address, so we can then look at that within our own connector and publish that information. Why do you encrypt it, but then include the pin pointer? It's not like it, we're at the point of encrypting the receiver. And then include the payment pointer. Yeah. We yes. unencrypt it in our connector. We just don't want the person who sends it or anyone to see it. Would, like, would I say this? Yeah. So it's sorry, only one card. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Like, yeah, we'll talk about this later, I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's off topic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would the idea then be every second one would have to be a, a, like a, a key? Uh, second one being like G Sorry, dot. Yeah, G dot every, oh. every You second. can have uh, multiple tiers of certificate signed certificates. So like, I have a certificate signed by Evan that gives me G dot Evans hash dot Stefan. Yeah. And then I can sign your key so you can get G dot Evans hash dot Stefan dot Matt. Sorry, I'm thinking about, I understand that, but from okay. an imp yeah, implementation idea, mm -hmm. you have to know where to look for the key. So it's the idea that you have to have that very set where you're looking mm -hmm. for the public keys. I think that since you know the IP address of the person that whose keys you're, whose key you're trying to get, perhaps you could send them an IP yeah, packet. Need a, to get might need a like, certificate request mm -hmm. protocol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Wait, why, why do you need those certificate? Wouldn't, wouldn't, isn't the, the way that you'd find out about an address would be getting a broadcast from someone, which would include the necessary certificate? You may just have one signature. that every time. Mm -hmm. You just have the signature. You kind I of see. just need it once. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So now instead of, the, instead of that directory of yeah. entities and signatures, you just go back down the path and ask everyone for their certificate. I, I don't know if that creates a circular dependency at some point. Like, I don't know how to send your packet yet because I haven't accepted the route that points to you yet. But no, but if someone broadcasts you a route, presumably they know how to get there, so you could just send them a. Like, yeah. Yeah, you can. yeah. I, I sort of keep. But you. It would but be if you're connected to an open network, though. 
No, but okay, so you, you broadcast a pack, you, you give me a routing update and it includes an ILP address that I don't know the key, the, the certificate of. Right. So then I sort of keep that in like this weird limbo state where I don't put in my routing table yet. And I send you a message that's like, could you forward a packet to that address? Um, and if you can't, then I just throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, and and you might disconnect from me because I sent you some info and stuff. Maybe. Right, because uh, I should have that data. Yeah. Uh, well, like, you, all you're asking for is this. No, actually you couldn't do that because uh, then a malicious actor could get you to get me to DP or you oh. by not responding to the request because um, you oh, can't know goodness. who didn't respond. So I would just throw, throw that out. Wait, no, no, no. So um, we could change the protocol so that you're not <laughs> requesting the certificate or keys from the originator but you could request it from your peer oh, and send it the router. Yeah. I see. And I would, I would always, always have that. You would already have it because you never, already verified. Exactly. I would never request yeah. a route that I don't have the certificate. Right, That's okay. Right. It's, just, it's just a certificate. Which it's is like, cool because then, yeah, it's, you, yeah. It's, very, it's just local traffic. It's like, yeah. this, one question. Uh, G.EvanHash.Stefan, you know, in English or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not in non-hash. Non <laughs> dot, like, how does Matt no, like I, I, maybe there's some he can like. Oh, that looks like a hash. I'm so, gonna like verify it. But the word Stefan is not a hash of anything. Yeah. So Matt Matt broadcasts a route to me, let's say, and he says I can route to hash dot Stefan dot Matt, and in that is a path. Uh, no, because the path for that is basically just him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so but he says I can. He, he it, there's three part three uh, routes there. There's the hash only, there's the hash dot Stefan and there's hash dot Stefan at Matt. That's true. And and That's they've true. each got signatures and any signatures I can't verify I ask Matt for the certificate for. Wait, and he so wait, 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 no, no. So if I get a route or you, sorry, if yeah. you stay the same same yeah. example. You get a route from Matt. Yeah. That's for G dot or G dot Evan hash dot Stefan dot Matt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you get that route, right? Yeah. So now you're like, okay, well, I need the certificate for G dot Evan hash dot Stefan dot Matt. Yeah. Okay. And so now, in order to get that certificate, you ask your peer, which is in this case Matt, yeah. for that certificate. So he will return a certificate, which is his public key signed by my public key, and the yeah. corresponding certificate signed by Evan, right, which passes okay, to yeah, the it's, it's the And whole. so you can say, like, oh, yes, this is the correct certificate for G dot Evan hash dot Stefan dot Matt. But, sorry, to to verify your key, yeah. it's the it's the word Stefan. It's not the hash of your key at all. So my how do I know my that you... It's a certificate that's signed by Evan. Your key is a certificate signed by Evan. Yep. Yes, but your address has, has nothing to do nothing with to doesn't it my doesn't matter? Well, then why does you, why does your why does your address? With, my address starts with G dot hash, which is how you know that my certificate should be a certificate that that's a, that's a signature from Evan saying like I issued a name yeah. sub address Stefan to to this key. As long as the roots match, the root the root of the certificate chain is yeah. Evan, and the root of the address is the hash of that certificate. As long as those match. So, so the, like, Matt can't lie about Stefan name because he doesn't have Evan's system because you don't need private key. One common database. Yeah. You can. Just... And, and what's interesting? Person. No, I'm just trying. Can, to, can Matt to lie about? Can Matt lie to Adrian about uh, Stefan sub addresses? That's interesting. If he says I can route to evanhash.dino.matt, let's say he sends me that route. Yeah. How do I verify? He needs to present a certificate, which is his key signed by Dino's key. No, no, no. He's, he's trying to lie. But right. but how does he know Dino's key versus your key? How does he differentiate? When he got the address g dot hash dot dino dot matt, yeah, he would have gotten Dino would given him a certificate at, at the same but, time. So in the issue. certificate, you binding the 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 name you were assigned, and the certificate that Evan signs for you binds the address Evan allocated you to right. your yeah. key. Great point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Is yes. He, he, he can't yeah. like talk yeah. about a different route and yeah. then... So, yeah. e so Evan is the certificate authority basically yeah. Yeah. and... For that namespace, for that yeah. address. For, for the whole address space. Yeah. yeah. For Evan hash that's the font, I'm the, name, the authority. I can issue anything underneath Evan hash that's the font. Yep. Such as Evan hash that's the font of Matt. 
But if we're talking about like some PKI terminology, but how do I use the root certificate authority for that? Yeah. Certificate How do you chain. begin, like, how, does that mean who is your parent, like, is right, he the exactly. root, like, how do you, where does this chain start? It starts with the hash that's included in the address. But you're saying who is that entity? Yeah. That's a, it's, it's a good question. So, like, who broadcast, who decides if you do the hash thing and broadcast that or the sub? What? Like so, I, I'm a new connector. I'm coming to the coming to the network. Do I make a public key, hash it, and broadcast that, or do I get you to sign a thing that becomes public? Yeah, you Depends choose on whatever your if you a connector your will. Be. Yeah, if a connector same as like you do today. If you want to be G.Evan, sure. But if you can't find a connector who's prepared to rebroadcast your roots, then you don't exist on the network. If you go to a connector who says you are G.AdrianHash.Evan. And I'll broadcast that. Mrs. is that the question you're asking? I'm still not sure if I understand it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How? Where does it start? Like, who is G? Can we write it out? G is the global G allocation is space. Yeah. There's no G. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is no G. What up, G? You can have like G so, so or test. Like, so, um, because we wanted to have things like localhost, like 127.0.0.1. We needed to split the global global address space into sub address spaces. So there's like local dot, which is for like your local host, and then there's test dot, which is for test addresses and for test net, and example dot, which is for examples that don't really exist, and g dot is for actual real world addresses. So the address starts with g dot. Yeah. Any real address starts with g dot. A, a, a test address which starts with test dot. We should have done with i or interlegible. <laughs> okay, so I am a connector. I want an address, and I started with G dot Anshul or something. That's currently how it works. That's how it works right now. Okay, so if I want to say um, that um, I'm G dot Anshul, and I can um, transfer to Stefan, what what is exactly happening then? I mean, how do I? Um, what do I? Announce. Um, say the example again. So I'm 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 a connector. I want to uh, broadcast my address to my peers. Yeah, yeah. I'm G dot Anshul. Is that? Okay. Yep. That's my IP address. Yeah, yeah. Um. Well, what what is my public key? Do I do I generate my own public private key and then sign it and then? This is exactly broadcast? the problem we're trying to solve right now. So right the proposal no. the proposal is to say you can't have G dot Anshul. You have to get g dot the hash of your public key, and so the reason people know that you're authorized to publish that address is because that the public key that you're signing it with hashes to the hash you're trying to claim. And who knows what my public key is? Um, you are announcing your public key to your peers. So you're basically saying, like, your your peer would ask for your public key after receiving the route announcement because we said. You know, if you don't have someone's certificate, if you don't have someone's public key, you would ask your peer for it that advertised that route. Oh, so I have to have the hash of my public key. That is okay. that, that has to be addressed. That's the current proposal we're debating. And I remembered why we didn't do it that way. Um, because the capacity for of the routing table is finite. And so we can't have an infinite number of people advertising routes. Therefore, we need a scheme that can limit the number of routes that are advertised, and such a scheme, the schemes that we came up with are as complex as the schemes that allow you to have vanity addresses, because you need to have sort of a stateful mechanism, you need a way to pay for claiming a new, or registering a new address, um, and so if, if you just allow anyone to advertise anything, then you, people can flood the system. But no. isn't, that, isn't that a result by what we just discussed, where if you connect with someone, and you try to, uh, like the majority of connectors, if you connect to them as a child, mm -hmm. they are not going to accept root broadcast from you. They're only going to... Well, what if we want to have an open network? But then that, then how does this change that? The, then we've got that problem anyway. Let's Anybody say, let's who, say, let's who say joins... Have, let's say you have an open network. Yeah. And I spin up a thousand nodes to connect at random locations in the network and start broadcasting as many prefixes as they can. What is, what's the 
It was the bound question. because eventually the routing tables would get full. Yeah, but that but that's no different to today, right? Yeah, correct. Well, today we can't have an open network because we don't have secure routing. Sure. Um, the 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 mechanism that we came up with maybe it's time to explain this mechanism. So the mechanism we came up with to register addresses um, it could also be used to limit how many re addresses there could be, and I'll explain how it works. So let's say. There's an open intelligent network, and we don't yet know how it works, but I'll describe what it looks like when a new node wants to join, claim a new prefix that's never existed before, and, and how that would work. So and I'll first um, explain a broken version of the protocol, and then one more step to fix it, um, just to keep it simple in the beginning. OK, so I'm a new node, and I connect to open intelligent, and I want g.angel. So I first connect to some peers, and I first only receive route broadcast from them. And so I'm building out my routing table. I'm, I've not announced myself as a new destination yet, I'm just building the routing table. But how do I know my peers in the first place? What is it? How do they discover my peers? That's a whole separate problem. I mean, like, think of it as you explicitly connect to them. Yeah, let's say there's a configuration file with IP addresses. Okay, there's a hard coded file. And yeah. Just like Bitcoin has. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but let's just say that. I mean, we could come up with a fancier bootstrapping protocol, but that's a different debate. Okay, so I've connected to a couple of peers. I, I'm receiving route updates from them, and so I'm starting to assemble a routing table. At the end of that process, I will have a, um, a routing entry for every top tier, every tier one prefix, because tier one prefixes can't be further consolidated. Um, Okay, so now I have a list of all tier one prefixes. Now I will um, send a, and, and also I have all the, the, the public keys of all tier one prefixes, um, which I get from my, actually it's, it's not a password. Um, so, I don't know how to solve that. Um, so I, 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 let's say I somehow have the keys, this might be a flaw. <laughs> let's say I have all the keys, and so now I send an advertisement to all tier one connectors, basically. So I send an ILP packet to all tier one connectors um, to say, um, here's my new uh, prefix that I'm trying to create, so g.actual. Um, and in, in, as part of that, it's an ILP packet. So I'm actually paying to create that prefix. And so the reason that people can't just create infinite prefixes is because there's a cost associated with it. Um, now every connector that receives that will register that prefix in my name. And since I've sent that packet to all T1 connectors, um, all T1 connectors will have my, my prefix registered to me. Um, now the problem that arises is a couple of things. So one is there, something could go wrong. Maybe someone just somewhere else also started a connector and I happen to have not known about that when I advertised it or maybe the routing table was bug bugged and maybe I just missed that destination. So it could be imperfect, basically. And so there needs to be some kind of scheme that over time removes imperfections. So something like, you know, if you know seven of my peers think a certain prefix is registered with a given address and I'm the only one that doesn't have it, maybe I reluctantly um, accept that, something like that. Um, the other thing which, which is a more, more clearly solvable problem is if I, um, if I try to claim an address, anyone who sees that advertisement can immediately try to send out their own claim for that address. Um, that one's pretty solvable because you can say, I first send out an advertisement, a step, stage one advertisement where I'm claiming it, but I'm not saying what it is, and I just, I'm claiming a hash of it with a nonce in it, so nobody can know what I'm claiming, but I'm getting sort of the priority date, um, sort of like filing a patent you know, before it gets published, right? Um, and then later I send a second message. Um, the second one might be free because it's referring to the previous paid message. Um, and that one I actually reveal what I was claiming. And so nobody can preempt my claim. How do you, uh, um, how do you decide like, if someone sends out a commitment to an address and then later just doesn't uh, provide the decommitment to that? How do you uh, decide when to erase the data for that commitment? Um, you would, I mean, there could literally be a, in the specification, you could say like, you know, after, you know, one day, you erase the... So you need to like, somehow agree on that, right? No, um, because what, what, the worst case that can happen is that I send out the follow-up message 
at a time when some people have already forgotten about the commitment and some people haven't yet, and then my address would get registered only partially. But since I'm the one doing the registering and I'm the one who controls when the second stage goes out, I can just send it out early enough that it would be guaranteed to be below anyone's timeout. So you just need the time must be high enough for it to be possible to register everyone. So basically I'm attesting myself. Yes, I mean you try, it's, it's you're registering a name. And it's instead of registering it with one authority, you're registering with the whole network. And it is timestamp based, so if there are collisions, like even non-malicious, like he came up with the same... Um, yeah, so if two people try to they register the same name at the same time, they will both end up with partial registrations. They will both choose a new name, and that name will just never be able to be used because it wasn't clearly registered in, in the name of one person. That would not work for something like a domain name system because in a domain name system, if Coca-Cola got partially registered for and be forever unusable, that'd be terrible. But in a name system that no one ever sees and it's just sort of like an under the hood type thing, perhaps it would be more acceptable to have um, names be destroyed. It's an address system, actually. It's not a name system. So. Yeah. yeah. Was this the broken iterant or the fixed one? Uh, so the broken one was where you just in the clear try to claim an address yeah. because oh, then okay. anyone can preempt you. Okay. Um, I think there's still questionable things. So I think I mostly designed it still with the with a uh, closed system in mind. So I, I sort of where every node peers deliberately and, and things like you know, civil attacks are under concern because I'm only peering with nodes that I'm choosing. Um, if you have a completely open network where civil attacks can happen, so a civil attack for anyone who doesn't know, is a civil attack is when I just stack the deck. I, I just put out a bunch of malicious nodes and so the chance that you'll connect a bunch of malicious nodes is actually quite high. Um, and so in, in that scenario, some things that I mentioned, like for example, if all of my peers think a certain prefix is owned by a different key and I'm the only one who isn't and I change my mind, that wouldn't be safe in an open network because all of my peers couldn't happen to be malicious. Um, or at least it would be, we would have to think about it much more carefully in an open network. It might still be okay in some circumstances. But the, I think the fundamental thing is the reason we don't need a full on blockchain is because a double spend isn't necessarily a bad thing in the sense that um, even if, if the network ends up split and some people thinking this is the current state and some people think of that as the current state, that's fine as long as that's localized to the person that screwed up. Right? Like only I screw up my name, but I have, I, I'm not able to screw up like g.coil because g.coil is clearly registered. Everyone agrees who owns it because it was registered at some point. Yeah. Can you um, be more specific about what you consider tier ones? Like how do I know as this new node on the network who I actually have to send this registration to? Um, so a tier one is anyone whose address has only one segment after the g. Okay, so any address that I get that's that's only a single segment, I'm gonna send the registration to. That's gonna just keep growing that list, right? So in five years time, registering address is way more expensive than now. Um, well, it'll be the price, ideally, if we can design the protocol perfectly, I don't know if that's possible, but if we can, what we're trying to approximate is that the price reflects the actual resource cost to the network of so having one more address in the running table. Should go, should up, go yeah. up. It should like I'd argue, but but it, it should, should be go up based on like if the number of addresses registered grows faster than the computation capacity, then it should go up. If the um, number the computation capacity goes up faster than the number of addresses registered, then it should go down. And um, how how do you prevent tier ones like disparity in the pricing by the tier ones? Like who determines how much you have to pay? So there's like, you three are the only tier ones on the network, so now I've got your addresses, I have to send you a name registration. How do I know how much to so pay? It'll probably be locally decided by the tier one itself, because like if it's too high, then you just don't like connect to them. But now I've, now I've only half registered my name, like yeah. Stefan's rejected my name registration because he wants more money, but you guys have accepted it. Yeah, I, th I think, well, like, if you think about that, and, and you kind of, go through a couple of iterations of I react to you, you react to me. I think what happens with the equilibrium is something like 
if I, as a tier one, set my fee too high or just unreasonably high, then what I'll end up with is I will end up with not having certain destinations in my routing table and having to um, adopt them from my peers or some, through their like fallback mechanism, right? And so I don't get paid at all, right? Because I'm not... not Sorry, paid. explain that again. I was so, so when you send... The, let's say my fee is super high, more yeah. than you're willing to pay. Yeah. So when you register your name, you, you offer to pay in a certain amount, it's and below my threshold, yeah. I reject it, so I don't have your address in my routing table. So that causes an immediate problem, which is like, any of my customers are not able to route to any of yours. Yeah. Um, but eventually, if, if, I, if I say like, okay, I wanna fix my routing table, because everyone seems to know Adrian, but I don't, and so I wanna fix that, so I'm gonna accept that you know, my peers know Adrian, and so I'm just gonna copy that entry without getting paid for it, then I haven't made any money on yeah, it. Yeah, you lost the opportunity. And so, and so I, wanna set it, I wanna set it below what you're gonna pay for registering. Um, I, but I don't want to set it too low because if I set it super low, then a bunch of people that are just connecting and sp trying to spam people's routing tables, I'm going to be vulnerable to that. So I don't want to set it so low that I'm just going to end up with a bunch of garbage that other people don't accept. So I roughly want to be at a similar level as other people. I don't want to be above what people are willing to pay, and I don't want to be below what is what is enough to prevent spam. So what's interesting is I think you could combine these. I, I think you could still generate the address that you're going to use as a tier one from a public key, a hash of your public key, and then pay to have that. I mean, but it doesn't, I mean, what, why, why not still do that? Why not still have that way of associating keys to uh, addresses? Why have it? For security. Because you never got you remember when you were presenting the idea, you were like, oh, we still need a way to register public keys. And oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. Can and and, and I mean, the thing, what I'm yeah. I mean, this is untested, but I assume that the kind of emergent property of the network will be that there's not that much value in registering a top level address unless you prepare to be a tier one, like behave like a tier one. Like, why, why, yeah. like we, we had concerns about vanity addresses, but man, I, I think like. I think I think the incentive, and just to be clear, like the incentive is that you don't necessarily want a tier one address most of the time. Yeah, uh, it's better to get a free address from some connector in your neighborhood. Yeah, you know, that's both best for you and best for the network because yeah. the, the less tier ones there are, the better. Um, so, I think that's great. Yeah. So, uh, I, I guess my point being. I'm not sure that this is a problem that we have to solve desperately. Like I what is the problem? The uh, proliferation of tier one addresses. Well, it's an attack vector. Like I can it, register an infinite number of tier one addresses, which would make the routing protocol but, uh, entirely not interesting. Sure, sure. But, but I think the way that's solved is the fact that I've got to persuade people to rebroadcast that. Like. If I'm sending, if I decide I'm going to just pick this top level address, I connect to a bunch of people, and then say, "Hey, rebroadcast that." Like, why would they? They. Why they, wouldn't they? Are you suggesting like making registering tier one addresses a manual decision? Well, well it's going to be something bilateral, right? That's what it's so always been. So you're talking about a closed network. No, no, open network. Like, who, who, I who might randomly? Differently. So to me, an open network is one where anyone can just connect to it and broadcast any route. But when you say just connect, like what is the what are the what does that mean? Like I'm you just connect to you. I know nothing about you. You know nothing about me, and I connect to you, and, and I, I let you broadcast routes. That's to me. That's the open network, and the closed but, network's more what we have right now. Well, but uh, but uh, I think I think kind of the open network. it's more likely that I just <laughs> when I just connect to you, you give me an address. That's the more likely scenario. But then you have like tier ones that you can only join by peering with an existing tier one. And so the, the top tier of the network is not a peer-to-peer -peer network. It's, well, it is a peer-to-peer -peer network, but it's yeah. not it's one that can just join. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's like, I have to be explicitly invited to. And you can say that that's okay, but there are definitely people in the community that want a network where the tier one is just a thing anyone can connect to. What? You mean connect as? Sort of a clarifying connect question, as. but like, one of the differences it seems to me is Originally, we were designing very much with like a you have one uplink 
kind of model. Mm -hmm. And I'm, that's something I'm not sure whether that's the right way of, of thinking about it. And one of the concerns that I would have if I have multiple um, like uplinks, so to speak, um, is if I have an address like basically, do I get do I have two addresses, and then which one do I give to you? And can people, if I give you the, if I'm connected to the two of you, and I'm telling somebody else to pay me, like I'm not sure which one of you has the better rates, um, and can people find me through you if I give them the address that's you can underneath guess. you? You would yes. broadcast yeah. that. So yeah. is, it, is it not like just a prefix? Well, it depends it's on a clearing relationship where you're top. not necessarily. Th yeah, think, think of it as like there's some tree structure to this network and I'm not at the top level. And so I, I'm connected to like multiple providers that are yeah, like so bigger than in, me. In that case, if let's say you are connected to multiple providers, you can obviously only have one address. Yeah. Or Why? Well, you can have two addresses. You can't both cost for it. You can't use yeah. both of them at the same time. So like, let's say you want, like, I, are you querying my SPSP mm -hmm. receiver? I gotta give you one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in order for me to be able to use the bandwidth of both and the routing proximity of both, um, the only way to do that is if provider A who gave me the address, I mean, they don't have to do anything special, they just give me the address, and if provider B then lets me announce a route of provider that I got from with the address of provider A. Because then people that are close to provider B will see a faster path to get to my specific prefix, um, and the routing protocol does that. And um, the only concern is how do I prove to B that I have the address from A mm -hmm. without some kind of RPKI type thing. And so the way that works on the internet today is literally I, I, I get on the phone with them, and you know, like you know, um, to the extent that there's RPKI, maybe they can look it up in a database. Um, but it's a pretty manual process. So, I mean, but like having a secure routing protocol would solve that. Like in a secure routing protocol, I would have a certificate that's signed by Evan Hash, blah, blah, blah. And so I would just present that to B, and then B would say, like, okay, yeah, you can broadcast routes for that destination because you are, have that prefix. This is kind of like, we thought it through this a little bit and, and, and how you would implement it. And this is part of what's leading to my question around the need to be a tier one. Like, if I can just pair with a bunch of people and they all allocate me addresses and I can use all of those addresses by broadcasting them to each other, why do I, what's the value of me being at tier one? Like, I'm on the network, I'm, I've got multiple connections, I'm, you know, if, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm not entirely sure what the value is in, in me being considered a peer of those guys rather than a child. To me, it seems like a bit of the, I don't know, what, what's the, fallback behavior to some extent like okay let's say I do broadcast like I have these two uplinks and then like Stefan changes his key or somehow like goes away or something like that like maybe my my stuff is like properly propagated through this channel but it seems like I'm more in control of my maybe I'm wrong about this but it seems like I'm a little more in control of my own destiny so to speak if I'm not if my if I'm in no way associated with Stefan uh, well, I think, I think that there's a big difference whether we're talking about um, I want to be able to be a tier one. That's like one thing. I might, I, might, I might have some reason why I want to be able to be a tier one. And that's one debate. And then the other one is I think what you just described, which is like I want to have lots of options of how to connect. Right? And so like you said, you call it fallback, right? So like I have two uplinks, but there's like a hundred more that I could be using. Uh -huh. Right? And I think you could satisfy that just by having enough tier ones and, and you know that there's plenty of choices. Um, I think I think saying that you have to be able to be a tier one, like anyone has to be able to be a tier one without make, making phone calls, um, that's a different thing. With the model you described, I mean, what stops an initial like five companies becoming tier ones, including not to allow other people to become tier ones? Um, very good question. I would say. Um, what stops them is the amount of value that the community gives to not having a centralized network. Because if, you know, let's say Coil is a customer of one of those five, and Coil realizes that those five are colluding together. Well, we probably want to switch to a different provider. 
You know, even if that means like leaving behind a big chunk of the network, because there's just too much of a deeply held belief that coil is only valuable because of the openness of the network. So clarifying question on the auto peering kind of tier one idea. <coughs> so that's just another, another response to that, sorry, would, would be like, it seems like the, the value of being a tier one, quote unquote, is sort of hard to define. Whereas like having the maximum amount of connectivity to the rest of the network, it, hopefully there's more value in having connectivity and actually like processing traffic as opposed to whatever value you get from being a tier one. I was thinking about that also with like, when we're talking about how expensive is it to broadcast stuff, hopefully the total accumulated value of having a route to someone is many orders of magnitude more than the amount that they might pay you on the initial setup for that. It's also really interesting to think about the economics of being a tier one provider. So let's say I'm level three. And so I have the most connections out of anyone in the Just world. Just explain what level oh, three sorry. is. Uh, level three is the largest uh, internet provider, internet service provider, top tier, tier one internet service provider. Um, and so a lot of people would want to be connected to level three because then that puts them in close proximity to everyone else because they're super well connected. Now, if, and, and I can charge a premium for that, right? Like you'd rather connect to me than to some, you know, backwater kind of provider somewhere, who knows where. And so, that premium anymore. And so I will get less new connections. And so other connections will start to grow. Like the second largest, the third largest will start to get bigger. And so there's a, there's a, a price floor and a price ceiling where it's like, I don't want to, you know, charge below a certain amount because I, I want to take advantage of my position. But I also can't charge too much because I will, I will borrow from the future because my position will be fine. But also we can all together collude and raise the price. Um, like the problem is, I mean, if there's literally like such a finite set of like five tier ones or something like that that could do that. But in practice, like there's like let's say twenty tier ones, and so then you have the risk that one of the twenty will break ranks and quickly become the largest one because. If they're the only one that anyone can peer with, that's where everyone's going to peer. You know? Also, like you could have two outlinks, one to the like 20 or 5 or whatever, that maybe you have to pay more to get to people who are only using them. But then there might be this open network over here, which is charging a lower rate, and you can preferentially route through them if for people who can accept those paths. So the, again, yeah, the clarifying sure. question on how this would work. You three are all tier ones. I want to join the network. I want to be a tier one. So I connect to each of you. Why do I need to wait to like for you to broadcast lots of routes? Is that in case there's another tier one that's not directly connected to you? Well, that I'm not that really I'm not connected to directly. If I understood the way your process works, I sit and wait for you to broadcast lots of routes to me. Yeah. I get your address, your address, your address, but I also get a bunch of other tier one addresses. Yeah. Why do I need to wait for that? Why don't I just have a you have a sort of Root broadcasting fee you do and you do. When I connect to you, I pay you. I pay you the amount that you've said, right. and in return, you broadcast my address on. Right. Um, I guess I have no way of proving that you're doing that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know for sure that that protocol doesn't also work um, because you know. It, yeah, it's just um, it's a it's a more complicated protocol to think about because now. You're broadcasting your route to all three or to, to whatever your uplinks are, and then they have to decide.